Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's always a privilege to be able to speak about the Bible, and I thank you for giving me that opportunity again. Before we uh, just look at the passage, let's pray again. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would indeed speak to our hearts, to our minds, to our whole being as we look at your word. Take uh, anything that uh, may be unhelpful and um, we pray that you take out of uh, what I would say, help people really to see that it's your word, it's your truth that matters and it changes our lives, it changes our hearts and it makes us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, has anybody ever met anybody famous? Any uh, offers? Anybody met anybody famous? Well, we are a little uh, sort of insular. Have we met someone famous there? <laughs> well, okay, I shall t- go on. I met Silla Black. Silla Black? I met, I met Prince Charles and he was... Okay. Um, and that sort of Okay, Silla Black and Prince Charles. There's a, a duo, a dynamic duo, the, the King Charles III. So how did you feel after you'd met them? Excellent. And did you tell anybody about meeting them? Oh, yes, all of the papers. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I once walked through a park in Middlesbrough with three other people. Um, there was Ray Mallon, uh, famous for zero tolerance policing and former mayor of Middlesbrough. Uh, there was Steve Gibson, the chair of Middlesbrough Football Club and... Uh, somewhere in the uh, top 150 richest people uh, in the country. And the third person was Prince Charles, now King Charles III. And we walked through this park, and when Prince Charles came up, people waved a flag and cheered, and they wanted to shake his hand. Uh, Very well known and very uh, famous. And when Steve Gibson and Ray Mallon, who were walking together, walked along, people wanted to take their photograph or have a photograph of them with them. And then when I came along behind them, nobody took a blind bit of notice. Because I'm not famous. Uh, I have no reputation, only bad ones. And it's a funny thing, isn't it? Fame uh, and riches, how people are drawn to it somehow and they want to be connected to it. And I guess in in some way, um, it it does affect all of us somehow. We make these judgments about people um, based on what we think their circumstances are or uh, just their appearance even. Um, Now, it may come to some surprise to you, uh, but I do enjoy reading the fashion section of the Times on a Wednesday. Um, I enjoy seeing what is in and what is definitely out and what the rules are for the way we should dress. And let me just give you an example from three weeks ago. Um, the, the article is entitled, Wide, White or Tucked into Boots, I'm Just Wearing Trousers Now. Um, and this is what Harriet Walker, the fashion editor, says. Where were you when the midi dress died? A fortnight ago, on the front row in Milan, I realised hardly anybody else was wearing one, despite it having been fashion editor uniform for the past five years at least. But it was in Paris last week that confirmation finally came through. It's as over as the proverbial doornail. Almost everybody at the shows this month was in trousers. Wide leg, baggy and cropped, skinny flares, chinos, Cargo pants, tailored leather and jeans. So many jeans. White, blue, black, tucked into tall books or rolled over to show off a chunky bother. 
I lost count of how many pairs of Rea's ultra baggy fold style I spotted, brackets available from, for £140 from matchesfashion.com. I don't want you getting your phone out and ordering some now. Please wait till the end of the service. This was the first session in years that I didn't pack a single dress or skirt for fashion week. Instead, I had a trouser rotation of khaki black, army green and denim with a boiler suit to mix things up. You might have heard the phrase vibe shift. Well, here it is. Now, it's entirely possible that there's somebody in this room who actually understood that. Um, and if you're wearing a midi dress today, I'm sorry. Um, but at least it does help you understand why I'm wearing jeans today, because I've sent all my midi dresses to the charity shops straight away upon reading this. Uh, and of course, in my day, jeans were a sign of rebellion. When I was growing up, we sort of dressed down in jeans, you know, you were the rebel if you wore jeans. Of course, now um, we've got to go a bit further, and we've got to have holes in jeans. We actually buy them with holes in. Uh, and which is a mystery to me completely. I, I just kind of imagine going to buy a car and uh, the salesman saying, well, it's very fashionable now. We knock a mirror off here and we'll kick a hole in the side and I'll put a scratch down the side for you. And that's very fashionable. So um, there you are, there's your car. We, we wouldn't like it, would we? Uh, but anyway, that's just another point. And please don't point out people who uh, are wearing... Um, torn jeans today because Leah might be embarrassed. Oh, I, didn't, I wasn't going to say that. <coughs> um, but that's the way it is. We make a statement about who we are. People like to make a statement about the way they dress. Um, and particularly the rich and famous, they dress in fine clothes or fashionable clothes and they make a statement about themselves and we are supposed to uh, the rest of us stand back in awe and say, look at them. Uh, and of course, the, the, the sibling of clothes is jewellery. You know, we wear our Rolex watch or my Timex watches uh, I have. Um, and the jewellery we wear makes a statement. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, tennis players finish a match. Uh, it's quite often they reach into their bag and put on the Rolex watch which they've been given by their sponsors so that when they're receiving their trophy uh, it's seen with them because they're important people, the, the uh, makers of the watch want their watch to be seen with these famous people. It's a two-way sort of thing. Um, and of course this is nothing new. We go back to the first century Middle East in our passage and we read, my brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, um, you must not show favoritism. And then we give an example. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. People make a statement about who they are and we make judgments about people, about what they wear and what they look like and their appearance and their demeanor. And today's passage is really simple. Don't do it, isn't it? We must not show favoritism. And we're given that specific example. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also come in. If you so show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, of course, the good news for us this morning is that we know this doesn't happen at Oxford Road. Because if the mayor or the MP were to visit us, we would always put them in the worst seats that nobody else wants to sit of on the front row. <laughs> sit in here because nobody else wants to sit in it. But perhaps it's not like that. Um, but this isn't about inviting somebody and treating them with respect. It's, fair, it's completely appropriate to treat somebody uh, 
who we invite with respect. There's nothing wrong with that. We've invited you. We want to treat you with respect. The problem is how we treat everybody else, isn't it? Um, so it's a bit more like this, this situation. Two new people come into church one Sunday morning, unexpectedly. The first person we recognize, the famous businessman who is moving into the town to invest much needed money into Hartlepool Centre. He'll have to have very big pockets for that, won't he? Uh, he's appeared in the Hartlepool Mail and on Look North on Friday, just before the sports roundup for the weekend. Who would have thought it? So we give them special attention. But we perhaps invite somebody across to chat with them and somebody who can tell them around the church, this is the best seat uh, near the radiator any time after October. Um, especially if you're playing the piano and you get hot, cold hands, you might notice that as a, a, a habit. Um, and perhaps they could invite them back for lunch because this person is important, and if they think well of the church as well, well, they might want to invest in one of our projects and uh, support the church. This might be a good thing to do. The second person we also recognize, it's a rough sleeper who we saw outside Morrison's earlier in the week. A bit dirty and a bit smelly. Perhaps he's just looking for a bit of warmth and a free cup of coffee at the end. And what is our attitude to the person then? And James says, we must not show favoritism. And it's difficult, isn't it? Let's, let's just be honest about it. It is difficult. We all are comfortable in certain situations with certain people, even if we're not making judgments about people. Certain situations, certain people, we, we just seem to click with, and others we find difficult. So there's all that kind of psychology going on. Um, but this is about making judgments, isn't it? the people who we want to be in with and the people who we don't care really much about. A few weeks ago, Phil um, held some meetings in church looking at how we might serve in church and he asked us to share something where we felt God had really been close and working to us and speaking to us. And one of the people shared this rather beautiful uh, story. They said they'd been in a church um, a church that they were at fairly often, it wasn't Oxford Road. Um, and there was a person who often came in late who uh, was a bit dirty uh, and a bit smelly. And they, they came in late, there's a spare seat next to this person at the back. And they said, I was thinking, I hope they don't come and sit next to me. And I felt God saying to me very strongly, today, I want you to talk to this person, to be friendly to them, and to go and get them a cup of coffee. And it was such a strong sort of sense of God speaking to them. And in fact, that's what this person did. They changed their attitude and was friendly, relational with the person, got them a cup of coffee at the end of the service, had a chat. And it was th their feelings and they just felt in harmony with God, that God had worked in, in their lives. And that struck me as a really beautiful example of God working. We often think, don't we, how has God worked in my life? We think something big, something spectacular, you know, I'm, I made this decision, we, we did that, we gave this to that, we decided to go into Christian service then. But that simple following Understanding God's word, do not show favoritism, uh, was a beautiful example of a day-to-day -day God speaking to us and working in the hearts and the mind and the actions of one of his children. In the passage, James goes on to give reasons why we should not show favoritism 
uh, why it's important for a community who believe in trust in the glorious Lord Jesus. Reason one, verse five. God chooses the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich. It's a fact. Um, we live in a relatively wealthy society. Lots of people are comfortable, some more comfortable than others. Um, but Jesus, when he lived on earth, he had a heart for the poor. His main ministry was among the ordinary and the poor. He brought them healing, hope, wisdom, salvation, and he often stood up for them against the authorities of the day, and in particular, the prejudiced religious authorities of the day. He told us that the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God, and the meek, often despised by the rich and the powerful, the meek will inherit the earth. The poor are important and special and precious to the Lord Jesus. They should be to us. Reason two, perhaps a little controversial this one, isn't it generally the rich who oppress the poor? Now I know there are some people who are cheering and saying, yes, we're getting some good politics here. Um, James says, but you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into a court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to, who you, to whom you belong? Jesus didn't show partiality when he was on earth. He had a heart for the poor. Much of his time and his energy was spent on the poor and the helpless. But... He was no stranger to some rich folk too. For example, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, Nicodemus, one of the uh, ruling group, uh, of the religious authorities. So he's not saying here that all rich people oppress poor people. But it was obviously true in the situations that James was writing into that there was that oppression. And if we're honest about history and society, where exploitation happens, it generally happens from the rich because of their power to the poor who are less powerful. And that is because money corrupts. Money, the power of money, corrupts. And it takes special people with integrity to resist that corruption. So, when we show partiality to people who are rich, we are showing partiality to people who have a power that is likely to corrupt. There are some good people with money who can resist that power. We've got to say that. But in general, when we look, the rich corrupt, uh, oppress the poor. It's a fact of history it's a fact of life. So treat with care. Occasionally, the poor rise up and attack and oppress the rich. We call that revolution. And that's when you see many of the revolutions, the big revolutions of history, are when the poor are so oppressed by the rich that they react and use a different sort of power to fight back. So that's the second reason. The third reason is it's against the law of God. Simply, if we're Christians and we, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we believe he tells us how we should live through his law, then we have to take it seriously. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right, James says. But if you say, show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So in the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, um, the beginning of Deuteronomy, 
when judging, uh, the, they were commanded, do not show partiality in judging. So judging cases between people. Here, both small and great alike. Well, it's a comfort to know that the great and the rich don't get priority in our legal system, isn't it? Well, it would be nice if they didn't at times. Uh, and that's not to say our law, our, our legal system uh, isn't good and in general um, one of the better ones uh, that we see around. So we shouldn't show partiality. We should be fair to both small and great alike. And of course, the commandment that Jesus come up, um, quoted and said uh, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, uh, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. We should love God above all others. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So that's amazing. Everything that God commands us to do hangs on these two things, loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So if we show favoritism to the powerful and we discriminate against the poor, we are not loving our neighbor. It's as simple as that. And James tells us, as if he's really serious about this, and he thinks people will just think this is just another sort of bit around the edges that people think about what it means to follow Jesus. He says, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And then he gives an example. Well, of committing adultery and murder. He says, well, if, if you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you've broken the whole law. You are a sinner. And if you show favoritism, you sin. We don't use language in pulpits from the church like that very much, do we now? Uh, we're a bit softer. Well, we like to just gray the edges. But James is absolutely clear. If you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So he wants us to take this message seriously. Um, speak and act as those who are going to be judged. If you want mercy, we need to show mercy. It's a bit like when we pray the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's worth stopping it and thinking at that moment, do I really forgive those who trespass against me? Because if I don't, I'm praying that I won't get the forgiveness of God. So James wants us to take this seriously. Does this mean that we cannot be forgiven for slipping up and treating somebody unfairly? Of course not. Remember that God is on our side. He's not constantly trying to trip us up and to say, look what a sinner you are. I caught you out there. We read, don't we, in one of the letters, John's letter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we sin, if we show favoritism, we confess it, and we can be forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ, by our God. But what James is saying, we must take the Bible and its te teaching seriously. So, summing up, do not show favoritism to the rich and famous. Simple. Do not discriminate against the poor. Do not make a judgment based on appearances. Because God chooses the poor we are all poor in the sight of God, all poor and sinful, 
and God has showed his mercy to us. We don't show favoritism because in general, the rich will take advantage of the poor and money, if we chase it, is a corrupter. And we don't show favoritism because clearly and simply it is against the law of God. So this isn't just about our meetings on a Sunday and who comes into them. It's about our lives, isn't it? It's about how we treat people in our lives. It's about how we treat people in the rest of the life of the church, for example. And just to close this, I was talking to somebody this week um, about whether it's a good idea to have a community grocery store and a coffee shop in a church. And their response was something like this, that they thought a community grocery uh, store was a good idea, but they questioned whether a cafe would be. And the reason they thought this was a friend had tried to do something similar in the past, but the people that the coffee shop attracted were not very nice. And it was difficult. They had a difficult client group. And eventually, they ended up shutting the coffee shop down. Now, I don't want to criticize the person who said this, because I find it very understandable if you're running a coffee shop and people were difficult and it caused you to have to close it down. That is, you know, it's a sad situation. It's understandable. But however, I was left feeling uncomfortable with that and left asking myself, what would Jesus want to do in that situation? What would James say about it? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this or any church should necessarily have a store or a coffee shop. We're thinking about that, whether it's a good idea, no decisions being made. Uh, it was just an interesting example of a perspective on it. I find this really challenging. When I walk around the town, I feel uncomfortable seeing people in trouble, homeless people. I don't know how to talk to them. I want to show them respect and love and kindness. I feel uncomfortable in church if something comes in that disrupts the stability of a normal Sunday. I, I confess that. But I'm told, and I know it's right, that I must not show favoritism based on appearances. If that's how I feel, that's something I've got to deal with. And I have a God in heaven who will help me do that. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that at times it challenges our comfort, it challenges our beings, it challenges our personalities, but we know you want to do this because you want to make us more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who had a heart for the poor, who was able to mix with poor and rich alike and still maintain his uh, integrity uh, and his purity. Lord God, we ask you to work in our lives that we might be more like him. Forgive us when we are uh, prejudiced and uh, we show favoritism based on appearance. And Lord God, in all the decisions we make in our own lives uh, as a life of a church, help us to know that uh, we have a God who cares for all people, rich or poor, but has this special heart for the poor and the needy and help us to be more like him. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last week, Johnny Harrison reminded us um, that we should pay attention to our songs because we sing things in our songs and sometimes we just skip over them. Uh, the second verse of our closing song says this, Holy Spirit, come abide within. May your joy be seen in all I do. Love enough to cover every sin in each thought and deed and attitude. Kindness to the greatest and the least gentleness that sows the path of peace. Turn my striving into works of grace. Breath of God, show Christ 
in all I do. We'll stand and sing, and then Wendy's going to come up and uh, close our meeting. <laughs>